Hello and welcome to Two Girls in a Pod. I'm Sharon. I'm Christy. Good morning. Hope all of you are doing well. You know, one of the things is, is the other day as uh, Christy and I were getting some of our steps, I asked her about what she thought about emotional intelligence. And what was your response? I said that was interesting because I had never even heard that term until maybe about a month ago. I saw an article online and it was talking about emotional intelligence being more important really than IQ. And even after reading the article, I still felt somewhat confused. So so then we started talking about it. And I think that there's a lot of people, this is a thing that we're really hearing more and more about. I know we talk a lot about it in uh, therapeutically. And therapeutically, a lot of these things we're going to talk about today, I use on a daily basis. You know, I just don't call it emotional intelligence, but it's still along those same lines. But real quickly, so that people understand, the definition of emotional intelligence or emotional quotient is the ability to understand, use, and manage your own emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. So it sounds like it includes a lot of stuff within it. (laughs) It really does. And today we're going to just talk about the five elements of the emotional intelligence because I think this kind of gives this really great concept and I think, or it conceptualizes it really well, I should say. And I think the reason that it's kind of an important thing for us today is because I'm looking at how are people navigating things? How are they adapting to things? We were having so much more of an increase in anxiety and those kind of things. And I think that if people would understand emotional intelligence better, that would help bring some of that anxiety down. Oh, Um, yeah. And we're going to talk with, the first one is of these five elements is self-awareness. We have to be aware. And when we're talking about self-awareness, we're talking about being able to recognize and understanding your own emotions, what you're feeling, why you're feeling them. Or sometimes even the why you just appreciate the fact that you had the feeling, you sit with the feeling and then it goes away or whatever. But it's having that awareness. And also understanding that our emotions affect our surroundings. And that's part of that self-awareness is what is our emotion and how is it affecting not only us, but the things around us. I think that in doing that and having that self-awareness, one of the things that becomes kind of difficult for people, I know, even for myself, is that when you're identifying that feeling, sometimes you have to have some accountability and it's, and it makes you feel kind of bad because Maybe you're having a feeling about something that someone did and it's not a feeling that you want to have because it's not a good feeling. Maybe say like maybe envy or, or jealousy or something like that. Those kinds of things, it's hard to take accountability for that and say, why am I feeling that? Because it's not something you want to be a part of you, but sometimes those emotions are there and you have to acknowledge it. And then so in having that accountability, I think that's a little bit difficult for people sometimes. I think it is. And I think sometimes that's why people shy away from it. And, you know, I have to talk with my clients about, you know, don't be afraid of your feelings. We make them so much bigger than they really are. But once we have an awareness to them, they they don't feel as scary. They don't feel as big. Mm -hmm. They feel so much more manageable. Yeah, it's better if you address those things because... And a lot of times people will just keep denying it. And it's a lot of times you'll say, you know, something's bothering you or whatever. And you keep denying it and saying, no, no, nothing's wrong. There actually is that feeling there. But it's really that you don't want to admit that you're having that feeling about it. And that's really hard to face. But once you do, I really think when you have that awareness and you're actually willing to admit it to somebody and talk to them about it, you get past it much easier. I agree. The thing with this whole concept of self-awareness and aware of our feelings, what it's doing to those, that is where our intuition comes in. Gut feeling you may have it in the pit of your stomach. Oftentimes I tell people, go with your gut. That means go with your intuition. Same with, you know, when I'm teaching, you know, when we're talking and I have uh, several of my clients who are students, they start second guessing themselves. I said, no, that first gut thing is your brain or whatever, giving, showing you the answer or whatever. So it's very much similar to that trust in that trust it because it helps us to make the right choices for us. A lot of times when we doubt it is often when we 
let ourselves be talking out of that feeling or whatever because we're not trusting it because we're not trusting in the self-awareness that we have and that's super huge and that gut feeling is probably your body telling you that's the right choice yes absolutely do need to listen to that yeah the other thing is when we are self-aware we then know what our strengths are but we also know what our weaknesses are if i know what my strengths are i can build on those if i know what my weaknesses are I can nurture them and kind of be aware of them. And then I know what I need to work on if it's something so that it's enhancing the strengths that I already have or, you know, so that's really important. It also tells us what's important to us. And that becomes our value system. Call it your moral compass, whatever you want to call it. But that becomes that moral compass when we have that awareness of if we're listening to something and it's creating a feeling in us of empathy towards some cause or something that says something about us as well. That awareness is so super important to that. The second one is self-regulation. You have self-regulation after you have awareness. You have to have awareness first because you have to be aware of what's going on with you. And if you have that awareness, having that, being able to be honest with yourself. Yes, because once I have the self-awareness, then I'm in the place where I can manage my emotions. Mm -hmm. Self-awareness lets me know I'm having the emotion, Self-regulation is the step I go to to really be able to maintain and manage Mm -hmm. my emotion. And, you know, one of the things we do is we do a meditation. This is one that we really enjoy. Yeah, this affirmation that he does in this meditation really helped me to understand this better. Because I think in self-regulation, like you say, you have to have that acknowledgement. But then in order to be able to do anything about it, You have to look at it like this. So this affirmation says, observe your current mood as if you were inspecting your emotions from the outside, as if they were separate from your being. And when you're able to do that, the degree of that emotion shrinks. Yes. So if I'm angry, say, and I remove myself and I'm looking at my anger and then I remove the anger from me, I realize the anger is not who I am. It's something that's happening. And if I can take it outside of me and I can observe it outside of me, then I have power. I have the ability to regulate that then. Yes, because you're reducing it down to that moment in time and that's all that it is. It's an acknowledgement of the feeling, but also not letting it kind of overtake us, if that makes sense. Yeah, because you a lot of times people become so identified with the emotions, they just fly off the handle and there's no self-regulation in that. And you know, it's interesting because most people regulate their positive emotions much better. Negative ones, this is where this helps to regulate those negative ones more effectively. Yeah, because they can run away with you easily if you let it. And I think the thing is, is that when we learn to treat others with respect and try to stay in control, we talk about control. We're not talking about minimizing when I tell people, you know, we control our emotions. It doesn't mean we minimize them and we pretend like they don't exist. We acknowledge them, but we don't give them more power than they need. We don't give them more time than they need because we will often do that with negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And you can stay and simmer in it and then become miserable. What I always tell people is to practice this. When I tell people, especially when I'm working with people who can have a little bit of anger, (laughs) what I'll tell them is there's that nanosecond in your brain And that is your moment of pause. And a nanosecond in our brain is a longer period than out in this real world because our brain is moving extremely fast. It's firing billions of messages as we're sitting here. It's hard to comprehend outside of the brain. It's too fast. But in your brain, that nanosecond, and I tell people, focus on that. There's that moment between before you speak. It's not very long, but it is. That's when you take that breath. I tell you, And if you're angry, it doesn't mean you have to speak right away. If you're angry, I always tell people, take that cleansing breath. And sometimes when we pause for that nanosecond, that second of time, it gives us the moment to make a different choice. Mm -hmm. Sit with that emotion, identify it. That's the awareness. Then it helps you. It's important for us to stay true to our values, but we have to hold ourselves responsible and accountable for our mistakes. 
And that's where people struggle sometimes. Yeah. I think we're all guilty of that at some point in our life. I don't want to admit I did that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you grow up and you're a little bit older, there's no proof of it because there was no social media. It's almost easier to get away with it and say, no, I don't remember that. So if I don't remember, it really didn't happen. Today, you just can't do it, man, because there is somebody who has a recording of you doing stupid. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whether we want to admit it or not. And any of this takes so much practice. It'll rear its ugly head again and again throughout your life that you do have to address it. You know, we always talk about the practice of things, but if I'm brutally honest, I just had a situation recently where I had this, and that was when we went to do the snorkel. I know you weren't able to to do the flippers and the and the goggles and all of that in this. It wasn't like snorkeling so, like no, that. No, it was but... only like a eighth of a snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> but you had the guts to go and float out there and at least see what you could see. And I stayed on the boat. And in that moment, I had this overwhelming feeling. And I was so, I was hurt because you went out there without me. But it was my choice, and I know it was me needing to overcome my fear to make the choice to get out there. But there was that feeling that took me at the beginning of that, and I had such a hard time with it at first because I knew there was that part of me that wanted to be happy for you that you had the courage to do it, but there was that other part of me that was angry with myself, but I projected it at you, I think, because I didn't have the courage to go and do that. So I had to sit with that and realize that and and deal with it. And it took me a few, huh? <laughs> Just a little bit. And I kept telling you, you know, I'm, I'm upset with myself. I know that. I understand that that's what it is, that I didn't have the courage to go. But, you know, the flip side of that was, is that I had to pause and give you the time to do that. And that's listening to that piece of yourself, that internal thing, because my first thing, and I was so excited because I thought she was going to get to go and then it ended early. So that was really disappointing for me. And also the fact that I thought that she was right behind me because I was so focused on having to build my courage. I really wasn't looking behind me. I was building my courage to do this. And then once again, thinking it was four feet of water, (laughs) these metric people. (laughs) Because you hear in your head what you think you have to hear in your head. Maybe you'd have courage. I don't know. But the thing that was interesting is, and at first I didn't realize, you know, when I came back, I'm thinking, oh, Mal, she's going to at least, when I realized she was still in the boat, I thought, oh, well, okay, well, she'll get a, at least some picture, something to show that this happened. A video or that? No. Something. I was so identified with my emotions and so upset in that moment that I didn't even think to she, film it or anything. She didn't even get a chance to appreciate what I had just Exactly. It wasn't till later that I could appreciate, truly appreciate your accomplishment because I was so wrapped up in me. But the thing is, is that I did my best to give her the space to come to that. I was a little surprised because this isn't like you. Mm -hmm. Usually we are really good about if she does something, you know, like when you sang the national anthem, I was just so flipping happy. I didn't care. And that's how we usually are. We are just so overjoyed with that happiness for Whenever we overcome a fear, you doing this podcast was very hard for you and for me, but we, we've continued to encourage. So that was a little bit different for me. Right. But it's one of those things we live and learn. And we, and the thing is, is that I really appreciate it because, you know, communication is a big part of that, a part of resiliency. And I mean, uh, the emotional intelligence, and we're going to talk more about that, but to be able to identify. And the thing is, is that, If we mess up or if we have a feeling, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Life is all about practice. So the third one is motivation. That is our drive to improve and to achieve setting goals and standards for ourselves and consistently working towards those goals. We talk about the importance of that. It's taking initiative, not just talking, but it's taking that initiative even for us, we would talk about the podcast. We talked about the podcast. And then it was just one day we said, we're just going to do it. Because the talking is the part that starts it. But then you have to take that leap of faith in whatever that is and take that initiative and, and challenge ourselves. It's that motivation. We have to be in a place where we will take 
advantage of those opportunities that present themselves to us. And I think that's really important because they will come along. But we have to learn to be a little bit assertive with that. And oftentimes when we're not assertive with that, often people are not assertive, I should say. That's something that a lot of, you know, through the years of doing my job, I have found a lot of people, it's about learning to be assertive. And that means learning to have your voice. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to be a little bit of an optimist. You know, you have to have that optimism. Can I do this? But this next one, I think is so key. We have to have resiliency to be resilient. And with that, I think a lot of people, uh, they may have a very brief definition of what resiliency is, but I found this one and I really like it. What it means to be resilient. Resilience is the ability to withstand adversity and bounce back from difficult life events. Being resilient does not mean a person doesn't experience stress emotional upheaval, and suffering. Resilience involves the ability to work through emotional pain and suffering. I don't know if, is that why we have an in, such an increase in anxiety? Because our resiliency is not there? Are we letting the things around us, the situations get the better of us? And we're forgetting that to have that resiliency is to kind of keep that forward motion going, even with adversity. Yeah. And looking at and realizing that we have some sense of control over these situations and, and what is it that we can do to, what power do we have within the situation? Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is when people feel powerless, that sense of hopelessness, helplessness, whatever that is, even in that short time, I think what happens is they forget their resiliency. Yes. They forget that, that thing of looking for other options. And I always tell people, for every situation we're in, there are multiple, multiple options. But we will get fixated on one or two. I know that I just recently read an article and it was, there was an interview in there with a teacher, had been a teacher for many, many years. And that's one of the things that he was saying that he found was that it seemed like students did not have that resiliency to push forward. They said that he said that if something seemed hard or difficult, they were ready to throw in the towel immediately. And I think, you know, what's really interesting when we talk about that is I think once again, we've gotten into this place in our society where we talk about failure, 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 failure. So who wants to be a failure? I don't see anybody raising their hand saying, yeah, let me move to the front of the line with that. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that I think if we change that verbiage, and we help people understand, help students understand. And this is what I work with a lot with, because I, I have some high school students and I have some college students. And we talk a lot about this. They talk about, oh, you know, I didn't do, I'm not doing well in this class, you know, whatever. You know, they start kind of beating themselves up. And they're like, well, wait a minute. You know, remember everything that we do now, from something as simple as tying our shoes, took practice before Velcro. Yeah. <laughs> And slip-ons. Now, nobody, I don't even know if people do shoe strings unless you're wearing a tennis shoe. I don't know. But the thing is, and it's funny because, you know, when you watch a little kid, when they first learn how to tie their shoes, oh, good Lord, they want, they untie your shoes and they tie your shoes and they do this and they do that. Kids will do that. They're, they constantly practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it until they master it. Then they go on to the next thing. And guess what? In life, that's what we do. We practice, practice, practice till we master something and then we go on to the next thing. And sometimes we practice, practice, practice and we never quite master it because it's something that's flowing and moving and evolving. And that's okay. But we just keep moving along with it. But people who have this idea that if I cannot do it well, I am a failure, I lose value, all of those things tend to stop moving forward. Mm -hmm. They give up on themselves in that way. You were using the example of the tying the shoe. I was going to say, unless you were my cousin Haley, because she would just avoid that at all costs. <laughs> she did not want to learn to tie her shoe. As she's in high school now. I'm really hoping that she <laughs> ties her shoes. <laughs> or she wears Velcro or slip-ons. No. <laughs> she wears Crocs all the time. No. <laughs> but the other thing that was in that article, the one with the teacher, that was being written by a guy that had started up a tech company that was really big now. But he was talking about how when he started out, 
he was not good at academics. He didn't do well in school. He really struggled. And he said that he had a computer class when he was in high school and he had a teacher that identified that he had a gift with technology. And because of that, he started his company and did really well. So, I mean, that was one of those examples. I mean, being resilient, he struggled in school, but he made a comeback. And I think that's what it is. And it's not that we fail. No. So like, I don't view myself as a failure in mathematics. I just don't particularly care for them. I learn what I need to. I mean, I can do math. It's not my forte. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. So my thing is, is if it's something I don't like, I don't have to keep pushing and, you know, I don't have to keep saying, oh my God, I'm going to do this till I master it. No, I realize it's not my thing and I move on to the next thing. What? Well- And that was another example that he made is that if you're not good in something, there is a professional out there that does that very well. And that's what he was saying has, you know, made him so successful in his company was that he was willing to hire the people that he needed to that had the knowledge that he didn't possess. And that's the thing when we think that we have, I think if, you know, even walking away from anything is understanding that nobody has failed it's that continuous practice. If you make a mistake, this is the other thing. And I work with this, uh, with my clients on, you know, when we talk about parenting and stuff or in relationships, I always say if your child or somebody you love makes a mistake and sometimes it might be a bit, whatever I said, allow them the opportunity to redeem themselves because it is only when we allow redemption that we get growth. And I think that's really important. So remember, it's, Only when we allow people to redeem themselves do we get to see that growth. And that goes for us too. If we feel like we've made a mistake, show kindness to yourself. Allow yourself to redeem it, to make it right. And then you get to have a little bit of personal growth in there. And I think that's really an amazing thing when we get that opportunity. So allow those things. There's always something to be learned from those experiences. Absolutely. The fourth one is empathy. Empathy is your ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes, so to speak, or to see a situation from their perspective. Okay. As a therapist, we do that often. That That's like a huge piece of what I think therapy is, is our ability to step outside of ourselves and to be objective and see people in their lives without bias in all of that. And to really have that empathy for their situation because... Yeah, sometimes it's really hard, I think, for people to step out of themselves for a moment and see it. Unless you have those first two things that we talked about, the self-awareness and then the regulation, sometimes it's really hard to take yourself out of the situation and see it from another person's perspective. Well, it's hard to see somebody else's perspective if I'm emotionally dysregulated right because i can only then see what's going on with me and i don't have an awareness so absolutely the other thing about having empathy is the ability to acknowledge somebody else's feelings to truly hear them and to respond to that feeling we often talk about that you know respond if somebody's talking to you listen with intention and in listening with intention it opens me up more for empathy because I am actually hearing you. I'm not just hearing the words, but I will hear and I will feel the feeling behind the words. Right. And then I get to acknowledge that if somebody is feeling hurt, I will acknowledge their pain. And on the same thing, when my clients are excited, I will acknowledge that excitement as well. I will acknowledge what that moment means to them because I think, That's really important. Empathy also is being respectful, respecting diversity Mm -hmm. and inclusion, because in that we understand that everybody has, there are variations and variables to everybody. I don't have to understand somebody else's culture or whatever. All I have to do is be aware of it, be aware of what it means to the person I'm talking to and to understand that that has value to them. And if it has value to them, then it should have some value to me if I'm having some type of relationship with that person. Right. Well, I think you have to understand that 
this other people have a whole different set of experiences that have shaped their perception of the world, of different ideas and things like that. So you have to understand that not everybody's raised with the same values or different, you know what I mean? Culture. Culture, yeah, than you. So you have to take that into account that they are coming from their experience. Well, and I think even with that too, is, you know, when you have that, the holidays are coming up, you know, and then we have uh, friends that are Jewish and stuff. And so being respectful of that. And I think when people sit there and say, well, we should say Merry Christmas or whatever. And I understand when one says Happy Holidays, it's because there are several holidays that are celebrated within that time period. I don't think that when people say that they're often being disrespectful. Right. But I think it's actually the opposite. I think they're being more respectful in that, I don't know, do you celebrate Hanukkah? Do you celebrate any of the other holidays at this time? Well, I know for me, I always take into account that there are a few right in the, you have Christmas and New Year's a week apart. So, I mean, I'm always saying happy holidays, but I'm always extending it to both times, you know, so I don't So if you forget New that. Year's, you've already got it covered. I guess. it's. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think of it as I'm not trying to say Merry Christmas to somebody. I usually will just say happy holidays, but I, it's not necessarily because of what I don't want to say. <laughs> and often, you know, and the next piece of empathy is listening to communication. Is communication, 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 what people say and, what, and we talked about what their body is saying. So paying attention to the whole thing. So if I'm talking with somebody at the holiday time, I will say, I will listen to their greeting. If they say Merry Christmas, I will respond in like. If they say Happy Holidays, I will respond in like. Yeah. So I pay attention and I try to have an awareness of that. Now, it's really interesting because I have some Native Americans on my caseload. Okay. I do not wish them a happy Thanksgiving. Now, why do you think I don't wish them a happy Thanksgiving? It was not happy time for the Native Americans. (laughs) And, you know, some of my Native Americans have talked with me about that. And they said, you know, I want to share this with you. We don't celebrate Thanksgiving because of what it was for the indigenous people. And so it was not, they don't view it as a celebration in the same way. Right. They understand the gathering of people because to them, they gather as a people and they have celebration and they do that. But it is not for the same reason. Mm -hmm. So I am very aware of that. So I know not, I don't say that to them. Right. Now, my other ones, they'll say, you know, I've had the ones saying, oh, I won't see you, but, you know, have a uh, happy Thanksgiving. I will respond in like. Yeah. And so, but it's having that awareness. We have Wiccan friends. We have, we do not discriminate. Trust me, when we say our friendships are very diverse, they are very diverse. Right. (laughs) And we, when we love it. Yeah. Because diversity is important. It's another one of those things because I think it teaches us something. Right. The final thing is social skills. And that's how we adapt and kind of deal with people around us. And when somebody has good social skills, those are often the people who you'll go to to talk to. You'll seek them out. They often have pretty good leadership skills, those kind of things. Their social skills because they're mastering these other things of self-awareness and all of those, okay? People view them as more trustworthy too Mm -hmm. because of how they communicate. They're able to articulate in a way that people will understand. Right. So I think that's kind of a big thing. They also tend to be listeners. They listen in order to respond to what you're truly saying. So that social skill is being in those social environments and kind of navigating social environments. And, you know, oftentimes it, you've heard this, a couple goes to a party and the wife comes back and says, oh my God, did you notice that Jack and his wife are not getting along? And the husbands are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> oftentimes it's that awareness. It's the awareness. It's the intention. It's those social skills. But people who have good social skills are, they make good leaders, motivate others, they inspire others. They also have the ability to resolve conflict. And they know when to praise somebody. So when we look at that social skills of that, that I think is the, when you master, 
you master these other things, that self-control, that emotional, you know, you, you get your, that you have the awareness and the self-control and you have the empathy, the motivation, it all comes together and it shines through that social skill. Mm -hmm. That becomes that finished product in a way. How I present to the world. Do I present with confidence? Right. Am I able to articulate my thought and my feeling? Am I able to lead others? Am I able to set a good example for others? And that's why it's important to have all those things even prior to that, because your social skills are not going to come across good, you know, if you are in a emotionally distressed or those kinds of things. It's always interesting to me that sometimes when we first have someone come in to see you, sometimes it, it almost seems like there's a vacant thing with some people. They or they may even come across as if they're upset or bothered or whatever, or almost rude or those kinds of things. And what I find is that a lot of times after they've been coming in for a while and, and talking to you and, and they're identifying some of these things, they're so much better when they come in. They're a little more relaxed. They're a little more social. They have a more lighthearted feel or, you know what I mean? I think that sometimes when they come in, they're so stressed out or that, that they're not able to, to have that and communicate in that way. And I think that's what's always been kind of neat about having you up at the front is because not only did you see my clients, you would see all the other ladies' clients. And, you know, then some of the ladies would even listen to your feedback of what it was that you were seeing because you were able to gauge movement in a different way because if we had somebody who went in or we had the ADHD ones who would... <laughs> Every five minutes, is it time now? Is it time now? Is it time now? But then pretty soon she would say, you know what? They're not asking. Not as often or, you know. But that shows the personal growth and development of those individuals. And it's coming from somebody who is outside the situation. You don't know what we're doing therapeutically. No, but I could see a progression within the person. Yeah. So for, and I always tell people, you know, when you're doing something and you're, you're trying to make a change or something, get somebody you trust and ask them, have you noticed anything different? Because oftentimes people will notice differences in you before you will notice them. But they may be afraid to say anything. So it's good to check in. Yeah. And, you know, so I'll often tell my clients, you know, ask your spouse, you know, if they've noticed something, any differences or your kids or your kids, ask your parents, whatever. And then they'll say, oh, yeah, I noticed you're not raging as much. And then it's like, could you have told me that earlier? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what it does is it just reinforces and it's part of that motivation. But everybody, it starts with taking initiative for yourself. When you look at emotional intelligence versus IQ, IQ measures how smart you are, basically, how you can, it's, you know, your executive functioning, all that kind of stuff. So that's what that does. But what I have found in life, and I don't know if uh, y'all out there too, but sometimes the higher a person's IQ is, the less social they are. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's, they have a hard time navigating some of that. And I can speak from past experience and from past relationships where I've had people in my life who have extremely high IQs and they really struggle with the social piece of it. It's navigating the social aspects, the nuances. They kind of don't get it. It almost creates anxiety in them. Not that that's with all people. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But IQ is measuring one thing. I think, you know, when we look at why is emotional intelligence, emotional why is it so important is this is something we do on a daily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we talk about getting on that path of enlightenment or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter what word you put to it, but that's part of this because having awareness. That's personal growth. I think the place that I have improved so much with the emotional intelligence is the driving piece. Because I do not have, I do not experience road rage the way that I used to. Oh, Lordy, no. So no, I no, really no. feel like I've advanced <laughs> in that area. So I'm not like, I'll make my comments now when somebody does something stupid. But 
I don't get so enraged and identify with it and think, oh, you're going to try and stay on my rear end. I'm going to get behind you and push you down the road <laughs> or something like that. I don't do that anymore. So I'm really grateful that I feel like that I've made some improvements there. You know, it's funny because uh, Klein and I were talking about that yesterday about road rage. And I asked him, you know, how's the road rage going? He goes, you know, I don't really have it. He goes, it's really weird. Yeah. He goes, I just don't get angry like I used to. He goes, and you know, if people want to pass me, I said, it's that thing. And people said, oh, I'm going to get ahead of you. Oh, you want to be on my ass? I'll show you that. And he goes, what you've taught me is not to take it personal. Those people don't know me, nor do they care about me. They're on their way trying to get where they're needing to go. I'm taking it personal like this guy is intentionally cutting me off. I know. We make it all about us. And that's one of the things we often talk about is don't take it personally. You don't know what the person behind you is trying to get to, why they're in such a hurry to get there. But it, it is, does not serve you to become so emotionally identified that you just can't even control yourself. And I think that's what it is. I think that really, there's so many things to this. And, you know, I think it, it kind of ties into a lot of the stuff that we talk about on this podcast of, of, you know, being kind to yourself, giving yourself a little bit of grace, understanding that we all make mistakes, but giving ourselves the opportunity to redeem ourselves and those kind of things. In order to have those leadership qualities, we have to be able to have that awareness have that control, read people, because as a leader, working with another one of my clients, I said, she's doing wonderful. I love it. You know, but that was her thing. You know, we've talked about it. We've talked about it. We've talked about it. And then she went to a coaching seminar, but you know, not that that's not what I don't do, but anyway, we've discussed that too. No, <laughs> but she said, she goes, well, I was in there. She goes, I could, oh my gosh, Sharon, we've talked about that. You know what I mean? So she was able to identify it, but it reinforced it, resonated with her. When you know somebody's a good leader is when they have people who you get people who are experts in whatever areas, and then you delegate stuff to them. Mm -hmm. You don't try to do it all because you're doing everything for somebody does not allow for their development. You are stunting their growth. And that's what she's understanding now. Right. So I am super excited the next time I get to talk to her because that'll give her a little bit of time to work on this and use this. But it's about understanding what those roles are. And it's about setting personal boundaries too. And, you know, we didn't talk much about boundaries in this, but when you have an awareness of what is important to you and valuable to you, then you can make a boundary about it. If you don't have that awareness, you'll have this feeling of ick, but you don't know why you're having the ick. Well, because you've never identified the feeling when that person, somebody or some, it's breaking a boundary with you, it's crossing the line. You'll have the feeling, but if you don't ever stop and acknowledge the feeling, then you don't understand that you have to set a boundary. Once you set the boundary, it goes away. Mm -hmm. So all of this stuff goes hand in hand. And it's about how we become a well-rounded human being. Because the more well-rounded of a human being we are, the kinder we're going to treat other people. Well, the more you can go out into the world and be successful and, you know, promoting even others to be successful. Yes, there's a positivity about it. Yeah. We're not sitting here talking about, you know, this is sunshine and rainbows all the time. That's not what this is because life happens, situations happen, and that's okay. But it's realizing that every situation that comes, I will have a resiliency in order to how to overcome it and to get back on track again. Mm -hmm. So I think it's having that focus and that understanding that we don't have to, but I think it's important that we do have that emotional intelligence and that we work on it. You know, hopefully the goal is to evolve as we grow, we learn. So I feel like that that's why it's important to be able to identify these things and work on them, not just accept them as, Oh, that's one of my shortcomings. Well, identify it, work on it, really look at it. And because if you do, I think once you accept that about yourself and work to improve it, you're going to feel so much better about you. And I think that's a good point. You know, when you say that it's your shortcoming, just like I said, math isn't my math is not yours either. But it's not like we sat there and said, oh, wow, we suck at math. That's a shortcoming of ours. And so I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. No, you find things to do around it. 
you still have the ability to fulfill your dreams and stuff like that, even with some of those shortcomings, because you learn to navigate around them. Yes. And once you make that your intention, you find that you are connected with the people that you need to, in order to make those things happen. Like you say, neither one of us are math whizzes, but I mean, that hasn't stopped us from, uh, you know, own, owning our own practice and that kind of thing, you know. This reminds me is, you know, I was meeting with one of my clients and he's on the autism spectrum and so has had an IEP since day one of school. And he's a junior in high school. He no longer has the need for an IEP. And the reason why he learned emotional self-control. When we were in middle school, not so good meltdowns on a daily so if for those who don't know what an iep is what oh is that? that's an individual education plan so an iep is similar to a 504 you have them and that just helps they modify your work or they give you accommodations if you need that so he's been on one he you know what so so amazingly proud of this young man it was a real struggle when we first started and it was struggle for him and to see him today and to see that growth. So when people tell me, why well, I can't do that, and they're like, oh, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, you can. Because I'm telling you, this young man struggled with understanding the world around him because he can only see the world through his autism. And I am telling you, he is an ABC student. He, As he tells me, he hardly ever has any more restrictions because he's not having meltdowns. He's finding his place in the world and it's his place. We couldn't dictate it. We couldn't give it to him. He had to learn to navigate that. And he has. So he's developing that emotional intelligence because we are helping him to have self-control. He now controls his emotions more than he ever has. And to me, he's already a success. You know, but I look forward to seeing what more he can accomplish because he continues to work it and work it and work it. So I know, I know, I see it in my practice all the time, people developing these skills and what it does for their life, how it brings a sense of calm and they get to a place of, I'm okay, it's okay for me to be happy. And as I tell every single one of my clients, every single human being has the right to be happy. Everybody should be happy. And I know many people probably have read it many times. I know I've seen it online. It says Al, that you can't, you can't control the things that happen around you, but you can certainly control your reaction to them. And you control what is happening internally. Yeah. You do that. And so hopefully with this podcast today, you know, we've just kind of touched on some stuff and, you know, maybe you can sit down and look and say, oh, you know what? I'm doing really well in this area. Maybe I can do better in this area. Or, you know what? I know others. I, you know, I'm going to listen more with intention. And, and if there's somebody that I know, I can kind of pay it forward and I can kind of be that inspiration for them or whatever it is. There's little things that we can do always. And sometimes, you know, when it's communication and we struggle with communication, sometimes the greatest communication is simply hi, smiling at somebody, the acknowledgement that they exist in this world is a form of communication. But having that awareness, being aware of the things around you, in t not only around you, but in you, mm -hmm. and then being strong enough to communicate that. Just like I, I love that you communicated the feeling in that about what was going on with you with the snorkeling, because I know that was a difficult thing for you. And I know that it was a struggle because there were those two sides of it. You really wanted to be happy and at the same time. You have to deal with your internal emotion first. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, then you can acknowledge the other stuff going on around you. Yeah, because even like with that, I mean, to be able to acknowledge that I was feeling that way about it. And I didn't want, I was disappointed in myself because I was having that feeling. I wanted to just be happy. But being able to identify it and say, and take that accountability and, and say, I, you know, I was upset with you, even though it was completely... It didn't make any sense why I would have that feeling. So, you know, and once again, you just kind of talk through it. Yeah. So we really hope that you guys have an amazing week. And we hope that this enlightens somebody. And as always, we are so grateful for each and every one of you who listens and follows us and comments or 
any engagement you have with us, we truly, truly, truly appreciate it. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we will be back next week. Bye. Bye.